Um, so I do want to ask y'all, because I know I work with like nonprofits here in Chicago. Um, so I know that like orgs, some of them are like about spreading awareness and others are about like more so doing like actual actions. Um, I want to know how did y'all develop like the goal for nature's negotiators? So basically when we first sort of sat down and, and started talking about it, um, it really all kind of stemmed from we grew up in Colorado and our mom is an applied anthropologist. And so being surrounded by nature there combined with her really teaching us to, to give back um, sort of led us down this path of we were like, when we get a platform through our acting, we want to be sure to use it to give back and, and to, to spread awareness and spread change. Um, and so we were like, we have this great opportunity right now to create something. What would our, our three main goals be? And we sort of narrowed it down to one, bringing a group of disparate parties to, to the table to, to have like a think tank of sorts, or as I think we call it, a summit. Yeah. Um, and just make sure that everyone's voices are heard and, and that that way we can find a solution, a sustainable solution to the issue that works for everyone. Um, and then sort of supplemental to that, we also want to eventually um, use the fundraising to, to buy up plots of land and place them into conservation easements to help protect uh, migration routes and just the land in general so that it's preserved forevermore. And that our third mission was we want to be able to support all these other nonprofits who are already out there doing amazing work and a, you know, a ton of organizations, not just nonprofits, um, like the Jane Goodall Institution and everyone. So that way we can support all of our people with that. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> At like what age? Because I like I remember in school, like you know, like every Earth Day, you would like learn about like safe water and like all this stuff. At what age did y'all realize that like what you do has an impact on the environment? Mm. I think honestly, more so when we moved out to California. At least for me, because I was pretty young still when yeah. we lived in Colorado, and there everything seemed so abundant because it's just so green and we're with like three rivers going through our hometown and then when we moved out here and it was in a very severe drought it was sort of like okay this is i can see how we need to conserve this and that we need to be wary of our water usage and all that and so for me yeah around similarly when i was probably about 10 years old we lived in colorado still and our yeah. mom and dad both grew up in the same town and they were talking about just the difference in weather from when they were kids, when it used to have monsoon seasons, and it used to have, you know, so much more snow than we get now. Yeah. And that's pretty jarring to realize how, you know, in just one generation, how different um, a climate has become. Yeah. So I think for me that then, yeah, definitely coupled with California seeing that, which, you know, right. So yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> that would be, I'm gonna go 10 years old. <laughs> yeah. I think that's how old I was when we moved out. I like that question. Yeah. So it, I mean, as y'all just like mentioned, we constantly see the effects of like climate change and like what abusing the environment can do, even in just like one generation. And at the same time, we have folks like denying it, um, including lawmakers, kind of just being like, "No, we're we're all good," even though we also have like, <laughs> like it was like just the news headline. I think that was like, "Oh, by twenty twenty or twenty thirty, then like danger in terms of the climate." So like, what? I guess, like, how do y'all have those conversations? Or, like, does it even feel like that's the main goal is to get climate deniers to, like, see it this way? Or is it just to go, like, okay, y'all are stuck in your ways. We're just going to have to keep pushing without y'all. Like, what's the goal, at least to you? Yeah, I would definitely say that um, we it, – it can be so hard to hear. There's sort of, like, right, the two ends of the spectrum of people who are denying and – Personally, I don't know how to reach them, but um, you know, hopefully, part of our education and our nonprofit could could reach that for sure. Um, but more so, we wanted to focus on um, not, you know, not necessarily pointing fingers at anyone, but kind of reaching a common goal. <laughs> um, we love the ASMR of it all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, polluting actively as oh, we go yeah, by. Um, <laughs> but. Dad. <laughs> he hates it. Um, anyway, sort of lost my train of thought, but basically I think that we wanted to, our two, two of our main focuses, at least in our, in our thing that we are about to launch, would be education. That's a big piece of it. And so 
we hope that can reach as many people as possible. But the, the thing we're really focused on is um, bringing different groups, both commercial interests and um, environmental interests to the table so that we kind of come up with a sustainable solution for the environment, but also a sustainable solution in terms of um, something that is a common goal and a common compromise. So that collaboration can bring people forward. So I think we really want to um, give a message of hope. You know, there's no, there's no bad guys. I, I, we'd like to assume that everyone, if they, if they have they, the chance, you know. yeah, if they had uh, if it was the same economic <laughs> interest for them and, and it was doing something good for the environment as well, yeah. we assume we'd like to hope that most people would choose to do that. So we're trying not to um, point fingers wow. coming in at first, but give this message of hope that we, there's still a lot of things that we can do at a grassroots local level that can, you know, ultimately make those bigger changes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so considering how I feel like it can be very bleak talking about the environment, um, and y'all kind of like mentioned it already, but like for y'all, what keeps you going and being like, oh, okay, yeah. Because like, again, like it feels like every month or every year, then like we get another report that's kind of like, and just so you know that we have like four more years or like two more years or one more year. And then, like, the environment is over if we don't do anything. Like, how do y'all keep going, like, okay, we can do it. Like, there's still time when it keeps feeling like there isn't. I think, I mean, kind of to echo what she said, it can, and, and what you said, it can be pretty bleak to, to think about it sometimes and just sort of looking at the world, it, it's, it's tough to take in. But on the other hand, I, I think there's a lot of great, things happening that, that sort of help bring that, that message of hope. Mm -hmm. And they all sort of seem to be, ha I think sometimes for me, I get lost in the big picture a bit, and then I need mm -hmm. her to help me. Like, but look at what's going on and what, what can be fixed in the littler picture. And that's a lot of what Nature's Negotiators focuses on. It's like one issue at a time. Yeah. So that it's these, these small victories that can help build that hope and be like, mm -hmm. look, if we do act now, we can still fix it, but it doesn't have to be like we fix it all of it in one fell swoop, we can we can do it one thing at a time and like have these victories and, yeah. and see the change happen. We saw this film at Sundance that was a great analogy for that. Yeah, um, totally. It's called Blueback and it's, uh, I think it's, it's national release is actually on Earth Day. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this great analogy in it where there was a, a mother and a daughter and the daughter had grown up to try to save the entire reef in Australia. She was a scientist, she was doing, and she was just being met with so many obstacles. And her mother had spent her whole life um, devoted to saving just one part of the reef that they had lived in. And ultimately she succeeded in, in saving that, that one little ecosystem that's part of the reef and her daughter was able to study that um, in terms of the bigger picture. And I just thought that was a lovely analogy for what we're going for, which is yeah. mm -hmm. there's, you know, there is climate change and there are these things that are deadlines that, you know, we need to reach as a planet. But um, in the meantime, there's a lot of things that are fixable and there's a lot of things that we as individuals can do. Mm -hmm. I love that. I also love that it seems to be a bicycle gang or motorcycle gang, just like Oh right gosh. next to you. Oh, right. God, I swear. They just, think they're really see. against nature. <laughs> they want to stop it. They're like, y'all know, like, <laughs> know too much. They're like, they know too much. We gotta, like... <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but I, like, I love that, though, because I think often we forget, like, the world is so big, which can be scary, but it's also it's so big, we should try to be inspiring. Like, there's just so many things that you can just discover and, like, do. Um, That's absolutely true. That's, yeah. And I also know, since y'all are from Colorado, um, one thing I feel like Midwesterners know is that, like, Native Americans and, like, Indigenous people definitely have, like, like, these ties to the earth and this understanding of the earth that I think most folks do not. Um, or I guess, you know, that, like, capitalism has kind of thrown on the bus there so I want to know like what do you think we can all learn from the way that like native tribes kind of view and utilize the environment yeah I mean I think there's there's so much to learn there and I think really one of the the big thing my mom again she's an applied anthropologist and she's she spent the last 30 years I think um in the American Southwest and so and fighting for indigenous rights in the U.S. Yeah, so she's she's our personal hero. But um, <laughs> I think it's so important to us that 
everyone has a voice because, and then I'll answer the other part later, but um, mm -hmm. I think it, it's been seen a lot that promises have been made, especially to indigenous peoples that then have just been taken away. And it, I think it's because they weren't given the proper voice at the table um, to, to, to get to speak a point of view that, that no one else would have. And so bringing everyone together really is important to us. And that way everyone can, can have. So I think I, I said the same thing like four times. Yeah, no, and, <laughs> yeah. and a testament to what you were asked also, I think that um, lots of indigenous peoples around the earth, their, their everyday lives are intrinsically linked to the ecosystems that they live in. And so naturally they have a, a beautiful balance with nature and relationship with it, but also just a deep intimate knowledge of the ecosystems that they're living in, which yeah. a lot of people don't, like you were saying, in our you know, various different cultures, that's not as much of a focus. So um, obviously, you know, for an example, uh, the Inuit people, they have uh, so many more words for snow and ice than we do yeah. in the English language like in their language because it's so intrinsically linked to their lifestyle and their everyday world. And so I think that we would want to obviously bring them to the table in, in terms of finding a solution to these various issues because they have such a broad knowledge and perspective on it that we could hope to have. Yeah. Um, and that's so valuable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so I want y'all to talk about the campaign that y'all are planning to launch for Earth Day and what is the ask that you want the public to um, do and contribute to, especially young folks. We're really excited. I think we're actually kind of leading up to Earth Day starting on April 8th. We have our social media campaign launching and its main goal is to educate so that um, well, you kind of, you know, yeah. you have a bit more about it than I do. So like you said, we're hoping to be like really ramped up by Earth Day. So we're yeah. with our peers who have signed on to help us out with the social media campaign. We're launching April 8th. We're also in that time going to do a social media takeover with Seventeen Magazine. So that's coming that way. Um, and just as an overview of the first campaign we're focusing on, uh, they there's a just uh, there's a <laughs> last number. <I> <laughs> the, the king of salmon are very the king and the chinook king, of salmon yeah. in the Pacific Northwest ecosystem. They're very depleted. They're depleted, mm -hmm. and it's the last really wild ecosystem in the nation. And so. Yeah. Um, we want to fund and, and bring to the table, bring to these round uh, tables, um, various researchers and indigenous people and, and commercial, commercial and, fishing yeah. industries. And we've uh, got in contact with a lot of them. So our campaign is like Max said, we're, we're really trying to educate. And so we're mm -hmm. putting forward a lot of information for people to know in much more depth than I just overview <laughs> of the issue with Chinook salmon and pink salmon. Um, and, you know, a lot of the issues that they're facing are due to bigger issues like climate change, of course, but yeah. there's also a lot, there's of, a lot fixable, of fixable issues as well. Yeah, uh, that we can actively. Kind of like we were saying earlier, though, on a smaller level of like, we can, we can really go in there with these researchers who know so much about it and mm -hmm. these, these interests who, who are intricately involved with it and find a solution that helps everybody, but also helps the king and Chinook salmon help, you know, feed this ecosystem that is still thriving without our help and, uh, we want to make yeah. sure that it continues to thrive. So basically on April 8th, the ask for the public would be to share that information, get it out as much as possible. And anyone who's in a position to donate, that's obviously a huge piece of it, which is yes. this fundraising. And we're fundraising 100%. Um, we don't have an infrastructure with our nonprofit. So 100% of what we earn will go towards the these causes. causes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And we have real things that we're actively fundraising for. It's, it's not as much a uh, big picture. It's yeah. we want to fundraise the summit. We want to help uh, with selective fishing technology and permits for um commercial fishermen to yeah, use we're, that. We're kind of looking at it is like a half and half split of half of it will go to funding the actual think tank and round table and then the other half will go to the implementation of the solutions that are found by everyone at the round table. Yeah, so we're just hoping people will uh, go to both of our Instagrams and also our website <laughs> is <laughs> www.naturesnegotiators.org. We'll have a PSA coming up soon that's an overview and then the slides and various things will be coming up. Yep. So yeah. Wonderful. Also, because I'm pretty sure I'm uh, at least some of this interview will be posted in video form. So we want you to also yeah. shout out the Instagram handles so that folks know that too. Yeah. <laughs> I am at Happy Hollywood. I'm at Mad Max Donovan. 
which are my initials. So I, I, I did plan that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. So, um, Again, because as a Chicagoan, I'm pretty sure y'all have realized being in Chicago, one thing Chicago would love to do is talk about Chicago. Um, <laughs> Chicago, it's so cool. It's like one of our personality traits. It's that <laughs> and like demanding that Chicago pizza is better than New York pizza, which it is. Um, so I'm, I'm uncertain oh, okay. if I'm yeah. able to be. I'm so Ooh. sorry. I I've thought gotta be you like and then you're like, pizza. hmm. Yeah, deep dish pizza is really good. So <laughs> Chicago dogs, though, I would die for them. They are the I best. I don't hot eat dogs. hot dogs, so it's okay. Well, Chicago. Claire, dish... I thought we were like vibing, and it's just like, oh, it's just, like we're over it. I thought we were too. I don't really. Don't really <laughs> we did a donut dogs. crawl. Okay, oh, we can we can oh. come to terms on this. It's also oh, vegetarian, so you know, better for the environment. We're we did yes. a donut crawl all across Chicago. Hang on, I I, and I have a ranking of them in my phone. Our favorite, I think, nice. was do right. Do right chicken and donuts was really good. Stands are great. Yeah. Oh no, where is it? (laughs) (laughs) But sorry, what was your question? I I think not the breaking news donuts and Max can't find them. (laughs) This is obviously what's going to go. The donut crawl. (laughs) I have to like squint. (laughs) Oh yeah. So they're they're all pretty damn good. I think we gave them all like five stars. Nice. Do right donuts are top notch. That's why I always recommend um, old fashioned donuts, but it's like all the way on the south side of Chicago. But they are, they're great. They're wonderful. We'll add it to our list. We'll have to try it. We're always down <laughs> we're, for new donuts. We're pretty much doing a perpetual donut. Yeah. So that's, that's, donuts. <laughs> that's the, the, next, uh, the next plan. So it's acting, nature's negotiators, donuts. donut. It's like when Lord did that like onion ring. Instagram yeah. rating thing, yeah, like that. This is who we model our whole. Our whole <laughs> <laughs> um, but the question was basically, uh, so what are like some any like similarities and differences from like Chicago and Colorado? Or I guess for like LA for you, Max, as you said, you moved pretty young. I mean, I think I have to say Chicago does a really great job of having a lot of nature in the city. Like, we, we live in Lincoln Park because we go to DePaul there, and you can literally hop from, like, park to park, and it, you're pretty much surrounded by nature the whole time, which is similar to growing up in Colorado, where you're just always surrounded by nature. Uh, so that's definitely, I think, a good similarity. Uh, I think the, the difference is how small our town in Colorado is compared to Chicago, and Chicago is, like, a massive, awesome city, and our town in Colorado has, like, 7,000 people. I think it's yeah. just such a stark difference between the two. And it's wonderful to be, to, we can really get the best of both worlds we because do. being in Chicago and at the age we're at, like being a college kid in Chicago is so fun because there's so much music. I just went to a music club the other day. It was the coolest thing ever. There's just great people. There's great food. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's then, so much good food. Yeah. And then in Colorado, <laughs> growing up there was so lovely because at that age, there's you know so much. We, we played all the sports and mm-hmm. we, went rafting with our friends and um so I think culturally it's definitely yeah. different but a, really really fun in both phases of our life um and mm-hmm. then they're both pretty cold I would say as a similarity yeah they they get pretty cold I think Chicago might have Colorado beat yeah. but mm-hmm. there is skiing in Colorado so I mean you can water ski okay I'll give, I'll give you that water ski good point also like how what I said it as the one that went to Columbia why the Paul is of Columbia like no shade to it, but just curious. Okay. For me, <laughs> we'll put us on the I, spot like this. I practically follow her wherever she goes. You should blame me. No, no, I'm not gonna blame you. I love DePaul, but uh, she went to the Los Angeles County High School for the Arts, um, and then I like decided that's where I had to go because I wanted mm-hmm. to school with her for longer. And then she went to DePaul and was like, "Max, this place is great." And I'm like, "Okay, cool. I'm gonna apply." Mm-hmm. And I applied there, and that was pretty much the only place that I played. And for me, that, yeah, it was the only place I played also because I was really interested in the uh, partnership with Second City. So that's why I DePaul mm-hmm. and Columbia, in theory, they just, um, that partnership with Second City, the comedy filmmaking program is so exciting. And that's, you know, obviously we all want to be on SNL. That's the main dream. Mm-hmm. So that program really um, catered to that. So that's why. Yeah, and I am in the film program as well, the different tracks in her, I'm in directing. But they, they have a fantastic film school. And they've also yeah. been really great um, in terms of my filming schedule. They've let me 
you know, come back and forth more than I could have even asked. So, <laughs> thank you to Paul. <laughs> Columbia, That's when they were like, oh, yeah, oh yeah, great Columbia. alum. <laughs> Lita Waith went to Columbia, I think. And oh, yeah. I worship Lita Waith, so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Lita Waith. <laughs> yeah, it was like Lena Waith went. Um, A.D. Bryant also went, so that's an SNL person. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, hearing this, Chicago is like the place to go. It is. Yeah. That was like Second City. That's like, that's impressive right there. Like, that's a good group of company to be in. (laughs) I love it. It's really, it's inspiring just to walk in there and, you know, see people like A.D. Bryant on the wall. It's really exciting. Mm -hmm. So I do have to add, I'm very sorry, Claire. Because that's that new show. (laughs) <laughs> that's a new show one of my favorite shows of all time I actually watched it constantly so when that yeah, 90 show that. was announced <laughs> when that 90 show was announced I was like oh listen <laughs> let's get into it and like my the other person I'm on the site with me Mary she got to interview Callie and I was like my time is gonna come for me to interview someone from this show and so I was like well I we gotta take the time for it so I wanna know <laughs> Um, because I'm such a huge Death Avenue show fan that I know that there used to be that 80s show, very short-lived, didn't last that long. Um, and in the era of reboots, we already had that reboot, didn't work out. Why do you think now is a good time for them to try it again with this version? Yeah, I mean, I think one really nice thing about 90s show is that it's like a direct sequel to to 70s show so it almost feels like we just picked up where 70s show left off and we're right back at the foreman kitchen um but i think in terms of why now is the right timing for it there's a lot of nostalgia about you know the 80s the 90s and even that 70s show itself i for one was devastated when it got taken off of netflix and we had to go out and buy Mm -hmm. the, the little box set so that we could keep binging it uh, that was like the fourth time we watched it or something like that. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I think it was just good timing in terms of filling that sort of hole in people's hearts for that 70s show and bringing back these characters that everyone loved and seeing kind of where they're at now, quote unquote, because it's the 90s. But <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think it, it does a nice job of, of filling in that... that uh, I've lost my train of thought. Give me one second. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I think I have to hand it to everyone who's involved in it. They're all like comedy royalty. So mm-hmm. they have their perfect reasons for it. But my selfish reason for it is that I miss sitcoms. Like, yep. there's a lot of great comedy out there. But sort of that classic, like, multi-camera format sitcom there's there's not as many as there used to be and so it's nice that there's one that's already sort of familiar because it's the sequel it's a 70s show but mm-hmm. it helps fill in that gap i swear <laughs> we pick the loudest tree possible they're like we just are just gonna make sure that we are known and <laughs> i also hate that nice show they hate me. <laughs> How could they? <laughs> They're like my least favorite things, the environment and that night. They're show. Team J for sure. Oh. Team J. <laughs> nah, they couldn't. Not the sabotage, not your bestie sabotaging you. <laughs> <laughs> they sent them. I know he did. <laughs> um, so what con I guess it's not controversial, but I am curious to know like favorite season of the show. And Claire, you can also answer if you have one. Okay, my personal favorite season is season four. Because I, I guess, like, I'm going to say last episode of season three, going into season four of seven the show, when it's like, I don't want to spoil it too much, but there is that big breakup at the end of season three. Not spoiled. The show has been out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know the breakup, I mean. And then it sort of kicks off season four, and it's just like this explosive season. I don't know. I thought it was perfect. And I think, is, is it the first episode of that when Eric has his, like, a Christmas Carol moment and he goes through like past present future. That's such a yeah. good I love it. I just love when Eric is in his um his roller skating phase. Ooh. That one is one of my favorites. But that I that was I her screensaver for like a year. Really? Yeah. It's truly inspiring to me. It's great. <laughs> it's a human. <laughs> so uh was there a moment filming the first season where you felt like you found your footing as Nate? Mm. Okay. I think there was 
I, I honestly, I want to say that it was episode three or four, and we were shooting, um, like we were in the middle of our of our taping week, and I was sitting down talking to my family, and I was like, I feel like Nate kind of runs in and out of scenes a lot. Wouldn't it be so funny if he had like pager and gets paged and just bolts with no explanation? And so I was like, I should text Greg, the showrunner, and see what he would think of that. And I texted him, do you think Nate should have a pager? And he texted me back that they had already written in a pager for the next episode. And I had no idea. So I was like, they're two steps ahead of me, but I'm on the right path. I feel like I feel like I found Nate for you. But... <laughs> That's that directing mind coming through. You mean like, listen, I know what makes the, sense for a story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's that DePaul. <laughs> Uh, so by the end of the first season we already see Nate grow and we know that like Leia and him have a little bit of a spark there and then we well I guess spoilers but the, the show has been out for like it's been out two for months. Uh, if you haven't seen it what are you guys doing Come on, watch, watch. that's what listen it is it's classic sitcom y'all knew this was gonna happen well I don't know that's the question I'm having so with so much focus on Leia and Jay and on Nate and Nikki, they, like y'all know going in that that's how the season was going to end? Oh, we had no idea. We actually, we didn't find out until um, every Monday we have our table read and we didn't mm -hmm. do the final script until Sunday night. So it was like Sunday night to Monday morning was the whole time period. And I was out and about when we got the script and everyone in our little 90s show group chat started texting and they were like, oh my gosh they almost kiss and I was like who could they be talking about surely not me and then I go and I read it and I think my jaw literally went oh my, God, uh, my mind was blown but I, I think I mean it makes sense because now that I've like watched this, the season all the way through I see these little moments that, that Nate and they have had where they're sort of like very they seem very compatible but mm -hmm. definitely for me personally it came out of left field because I was just like not expecting that. <laughs> well, I mean, there's like this, because I was the same way when like when I was watching the show, I was like, yeah. well, okay. So I, I binge watched it and I think like a day or two. Um, and I was like, there's no way they're doing it. There's no way they're doing it. And then I got to be like, oh my God. <laughs> um, but I also like, no offense, I'm more so ship layer with Gwen. No shade to you, but like I just think that they're they just they they're make sense to me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I am interested in knowing for you, like who at the moment you're rooting for for Nate, and who are you rooting for for Leia? If it's them, I honestly have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's such a tough question because Nate and Nikki are so like in a way incompatible that it works mm -hmm. because they're such opposites that they just like complete each other they make each other work and it's, it's a great relationship but then on the other hand i feel like nate and leia are very similar in a lot of ways and they're sort of minutes in the show they're like these hopeless romantics and they're both very nice by nature and so i think they're also compatible but i really i have, I have no idea who i'm rooting for i know i'm team nate but i don't really know what that means so <laughs> Nate gets to have his own Eat, Pray, Love or like something 90s similar to Eat, Pray, Love. I don't know. <laughs> but I also like, I do love your point about um, Nate and Nikki because I feel like they work so well, but I also, like, I think both of them need to like grow and figure out who they are totally. before they can like really work out as a couple. But I also think ugh, they're just so cute just watching them. Like just like how much couple. they care about each other. It's just so great. Like a power couple, really. Totally. Yeah. Oh, well. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how do you feel like you've grown as an actor since filming the first season? And what do you hope to bring into season two? I think... I, I, oh, okay. Definitely, I have terrible stage fright and, like, always have. When I was in kindergarten, I did this little, like, production. Of, I think it was Good King Wenceslas for, like, the Christmas production. And I was so scared uh, to get up on that stage. And so I've never really done anything live before 90s show. And then we film in front of a live studio audience. So I kind of get up there and I was like, all right, I've got to, I, I guess I've got to get over the stage right thing. And so as the season went on, I definitely got way more comfortable and, and sort of let that adrenaline take over of, of being performing live. And uh, 
I've definitely grown in, in that department as an actor. I'm no longer afraid to, to do a live studio audience. <laughs> I still don't know if I could do a play, though, because that is just intimidating. In so mm -hmm. many ways. But yeah, I, and then to bring it to season two, I think it'll be nice to go into it already comfortable with that live studio audience, especially I think we might be expanding our live studio audience. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, mm -hmm. And just having that, you know, already established relationship with Nate and really feeling comfortable in his skin as well as my own. Mm -hmm. Well, I, cause Claire, since you're doing Second City, like I feel like you have, you're used to doing, um, I guess like performing in front of audiences. Like what is like your tip, <clears throat> excuse me. What are like your tips and tricks for like doing crowd control and doing comedy in that way? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Let me write this down. No, it's you're like I thought I could just chill back during this part. It's like no, I had questions for you. <laughs> um, no, I completely I agree with Max that it can be really nerve wracking. When I was a, we, I went to school for theater for high, high school, and I remember as a freshman, just just so nervous. But um, I didn't get into over theater because I was too scared. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I recently you just got into television. <laughs> just decided, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I so I did a play at the Echo Theater, which was which was really um, cool. It's this new satire called Put It or Being Black for Dummies, and that was the first time I'd done a professional play that was like a six week run. And for that, it was a completely new um, learning experience. And I'd say that the main thing I did was just sort of get into a ritual before every show, where I was like, you know, I'm going to look at this Pinterest board that I made for my character and listen to these songs and read through my scripts or read up, uh, sorry, read through my lines and like do a little vocal warm-up because it's so physical mm. to be on stage. Mm. I feel like you have to like really ground yourself in your voice and your body. Um, but other than that, it's just, it's the same as what all actors have to do. You just have to let it go, which is such a difficult thing to do, but also very freeing when you oh, can. <laughs> it's interesting knowing uh, what's like a prominent like moment in the 90s that you would be interested in seeing the show do like an episode around. I was thinking about it because I just watched... Uh... The, oh, of course, I'm blanking on the name. The, <laughs> the Last Dance on Netflix. <laughs> yes. It's all about the <laughs> Chicago about Bulls. The and mm -hmm. we, we've been going to a bunch of Chicago Bulls games in Chicago. And so I was like, I realized all of the finals for like the 95, 96, you know, all of the finals happened in June, which is mm -hmm. perfect timing for 90 show. So I feel like it could be it could be interesting to see the Chicago Bulls dynasty play out through the lens of Wisconsin in the nineties. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. why that was literally the one that I had noted, like one of my ideas. I was like, that would be so cool to see, because even because like Leia, Eric, Leia, and um, Donna live in Chicago. If I'm not yeah. mistaken, right? Yeah. So like an episode of y'all road tripping to Chicago. And kicks and sue. It's like um hop in my van, you know, it'd be great. <laughs> yeah. It's like the episode when they go uh, to Canada to get beer, I think. What right? Are you yeah. Doing? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I was like that. And then also the fact that like I think rent premieres on Broadway in June of like ninety six. And I was like, oh, Ozzy is definitely about to annoy like, them about oh. it. <laughs> Okay, that could be great. I actually like this one. Yes. Oh, man. That'd be amazing. <laughs> I also Especially think... Like, boom. Like, oh, a couple so years ago, I feel like that's so on people's minds. That'd be yeah. amazing. Yeah. I also think there was such a huge movement of music in the 90s. Yes. And mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with all things 90s. So it could be really cool to see, like, I don't know, maybe Nate and Jade do it, like, make a band or something. We're like oh, a Tupac mm -hmm. band. I would like some... Tupac band. <laughs> Tupac, right? Something Tupac. Something. <laughs> I would love it. The level of unhinged. That like there's just so much culture in the nineties. So I'm like, y'all have like so much room to play. It makes me so, so excited. <laughs> is there like do you know when production start? Are, are you allowed to say that? I know Netflix is very hush hush about a lot of stuff. Say. I, I, I'm not I'm not sure if I can give specifics, but um it's it's starting at a at a at a time. Will it be hot or cold in <laughs> Chicago when it starts? <laughs> Is it ever? I don't really. I don't know. It'd be neutral. <laughs> okay, I'll just. I know say the exact date and month. So now. I, haven't, I haven't been in Chicago at this time yet. I'll say that much. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. 
<laughs> Taking the bad NDA. <laughs> but I feel like that's a for people who have been around, they know what that means. Other people do not. Um, so my final question, and I'm what can we expect from the double Donovans, as I believe your YouTube yeah. channel is called? <laughs> yes. Coming up. Yes. Um <laughs> So for me, yeah, as I said, I'm doing the Second City Partnership Program at Paul, and I'm loving it, and that's been giving me lots of time to, you know, obviously we're primarily actors, but I also love writing, and so that whole She's also comedy. really, really good at it, so it's... <laughs> mm -hmm. I wish, sometimes I sit down and I'm like, I'm going to write, and then I, like, get a page done and I feel great about myself, and then she'll send me, like, hey, I wrote this feature film for fun. And I'm like, <laughs> He's a I, and he's bro, in the I literally program, so he's doing that. Okay, I'm doing that. <laughs> That's my like, bro. I literally have a degree in uh, creative writing and television writing, and I feel you very, very much. It's <laughs> <laughs> tough. Um, I don't know how she. Yeah. And the other thing that we're working on, sort of as a family, in terms of producing our own content, is a uh, well, not our own, but we are we're working with Joanne Boyce to um, bring to life the story of the Clinton Twelve. Mm -hmm. So we're working mm -hmm. actually with the writer from that '90s show. Yep. Um, on that script, string that. And then we just, we just, uh, I think we've got all of the got... content done for for our social media campaign. So that's, I guess, like our next thing as yeah. Double Donovan. And he also has Donovan. a guest star. I'll brag for him. He's guest star coming up on say. something. On something. I don't know if I could. I signed an NDA for all of this. Yeah, no, Nicole's don't. saying no. no. <laughs> Quickly, yes. they. Period. Nicole, she said okay. you. Okay. Please thank, thank make you, it sure. <laughs> I, I did do a guest star on something that will be coming out soon-ish, I think. So. And then, yeah, that's our big thing is our April 8th campaign. We have a PSA coming out and uh, various yeah. things. And yeah, our website is launching. So yeah. 